I'm Tom Urim. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, types of workflows. This is basically just um, workflows that I've, uh, I've encountered in my experience. So there's this funny uh, situation where I think we probably all find ourselves in, where uh, you're faced with a repetitive task, you have a choice whether you're going to do the same thing 100 times over or whether you'll write some small piece of code to do it and then you'll never have to do the repetitive task again. So this XKCD comic um, strikes at that. Uh, you know, you, you think that maybe it'll be a little bit more work to write the code to perform the repetitive task, but still you'll finish in the same amount of time. That's, that's the theory, at least. Um, because what ends up happening is that you're really uh, debugging and rethinking what you're doing, and that maybe you spend so much time doing the, uh, writing the code to perform the task that, jokingly, there's no time for the original task anymore. Um, I know I've found myself in at least the case where uh, I've, I've always wanted to write the code to do the repetitive task instead of doing it. Um, I don't think I've ended up in the, the sad right-hand side of the lower graph. Now I'm going to try and convince you that uh, workflows will do that for you without taking you to that bad part on the right side of the lower graph. So when we talk about workflows, uh, basically we all have workflows, right? You, you spend uh, a lot of time, you spent a lot of time in the last two weeks um, learning about uh, different programming paradigms and how to optimize your code and hearing from application scientists in a bunch of different domains. Um, and you can make your code run better. And maybe you can make your simulations and your analyses run better. But the point is that uh, in this case, by having multiple phases of a, of a workflow, you have a workflow, right? You have two things that will run. And that's the simplest case. We run large simulations on, on Mira, and you do some analysis afterward. They're connected by the data that flows between them. You'd like to get your work done as fast as possible, so, um, so you strategically schedule jobs to make that happen. Um, at, the, at the level of managing that workflow manually, it certainly seems doable, right? But um, the parts may split apart uh, for a variety of reasons. So they may be because of configuration differences. Maybe you run the same application twice so, uh, sequentially, but in slightly different configurations. Um, it could be that your simulation and your analysis use different executables, so they are distinctly different phases. Uh, they might have different levels of parallelism <coughs> um, or vary based on the platform. So I've had applications where uh, one phase of the application wanted to run on the GPU and the next phase really didn't perform well on the GPU. So it was using the CPU. And in both cases, we want to use all of the GPUs and all of the CPU cores. But they're exhibiting different levels of parallelism. And uh, they're using different architectures. So we can bundle them into a single application this way, but um, it might be better that they run separately. And so at this point, we have two different phases that will run. Um, and again, uh, it would be nice to construct them into a workflow. And also, based on variations in resources and allocations that you have, you might choose to run things in different places. So again, this gets back to, uh, for example, um, at Argon, where we have Mira and we have Cooley, the GPU resource. Um, there are different types of resources, and you'll use them for different things. So just to give an example of a more complex uh, workflow, Here's an example of uh, doing image processing on functional MRI images. So you can see from uh, top to bottom how this workflow progresses. As we're processing all of these di different inputs, they go through different phases, and at different times you have uh, different levels of parallelism in the workflow, proceeding all the way to the bottom. Now, if you were to try to run this workflow uh, manually by submitting jobs, you can imagine it would become burdensome. So we talked somewhat about this, but um, why do we end up wanting to run workflows? Uh, so based on the last example, 
you see we have some complexity in task structure that can guide us to, to the place where we want to be able to, to code what actually happens. Um, in a simple example where you have simulation and analysis, it's straightforward. You might do that by yourself. Um, if you had 10,000 of them to do, you would probably code some Python script to run over them and submit jobs. Um, you would quickly run into uh, quotas um, on number of queued jobs or number of running jobs, right? So your Python code would have to be a little smarter than just submitting 10,000 jobs. Um, as things get more complex and you have maybe multiple steps in your simulation, multiple steps in your analysis, again, we see this complexity in the structure. Um, parameter sweeps are another example where uh, a, a small idea generates a lot of jobs. So um, that's another, another way of looking at that. Um, and again, it's compounded by multiple sites and uh, resources. And then generally, overall management of a uh, computing campaign, um, if you look at jobs run, analyses done, uh, results produced, and how you keep track of all of that, uh, it can become tedious. So I, I'm familiar with people who, uh, with, with projects that manually manage all of their jobs and it's perfectly, it makes perfect sense for them to do that because of the scale of what they're doing and uh, they, they can keep track of everything by using the file system. I guess probably most of you do that now. Um, but as soon as you get to a place where uh, you know, there's a, there's a tipping point where it becomes easier to manage if uh, you script the whole thing. Um, eventually, you come back to a point where, in some sciences, uh, the, the body of data that you build up over years of simulation is, um, is useful to look back on. And if you have a record and a way of accessing it uh, in a... In a um, maybe a machine readable way so that you can go back and do analyses across a long range of simulations that is very helpful. Um, it doesn't always work out that way because of cycles that we have on machines. You know, our big machines last for so long. The associated storage lasts for so long. You have to move data around. Where is the body of your data that you've produced over the past 10 years of simulations? Right? Um, it's not always easy to keep track of. Having this kind of record um, is useful and uh, gets to provenance or reproducibility. So we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Um, I listed a number of uh, workflow tools. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'll just touch on a couple of them. So you're all doing uh, HPC, you're using schedulers, and so you're familiar with schedulers, no question there, right? Um, but, uh, and to some extent, scheduling jobs and managing the history of your jobs simply by the encapsulation that that gives you is sufficient. Uh, some, many schedulers will allow you to set job dependencies between jobs, and at that point you have a simple workflow scenario where you're joining jobs together and they proceed through the, uh, the system based on their data dependencies. Um, Condor is a, a, another example um, where it's used in the cluster community typically and it spins up workers on different uh, compute nodes and they take, wor take work uh, as it's doled out to them. Um, Pegasus, uh, a little farther down the list, um, is a, provides an XML-like description for um, describing the workflow and the data flow between them and then mapping that description onto um, basically Condor workflows so that you can submit them to specific resources with specific data. Um, you'll hear about Swift next. Uh, I've used Swift for projects in the past. It's a, a language that allows you to express the stages in your workflow um, functionally so that each function basically represents a job that will be submitted to a resource. And the interesting thing there is that uh, Swift, it's its own language, and so they have built into it the ability for uh, understanding the data dependencies and not blocking on uh, execution of individual jobs, right? So you might have blocks that um, appear sequentially in the code, but 
It will exploit the availability of the data inputs that are produced along the way to schedule jobs as soon as they can to maximize the concurrency. <clears throat> uh, here's just some more, but uh, one I'll mention is uh, Galaxy because I've worked with it, and I'll give you an example of that one shortly. Galaxy is uh, an environment where you can wrap particular tools for execution and then use a graphical web-based um, interface for uh, building workflows from these individual modules. So we talked uh, somewhat about this. So workflow tools will allow you to do what's often called HTC instead of HPC, high throughput computing, or many task computing like parameter sweeps. Um, they'll often manage the data staging for you if you have multiple resources. It'll bring the, the data in that you need to run the job, and when you're finished, bring the data back out. Uh, it said approximately portability. It's not really portability that we're talking about here because um, what this is is it's so high level and it's managing the execution of individual applications where the applications are themselves, of course, compiled for the target uh, resource. But um, the flow between applications is encoded as a workflow. And so I could encode this workflow and then say I want to run it on uh, Mira and Cooley today and on Aurora and Theta later, and the workflow itself would remain the same. So in this case, maybe you get a win out of encoding this flow and being able to carry that work forward. And people always have this concern about um, adopting a particular tool as an essential part of their uh, the, the work that they're doing, and um, you know what that commits them to for the long term, and whether they uh, whether they'll be locked in in some way to always using that tool, or what they'll do to migrate to another tool. And in this case, um, depending on the tool that you use you should have some sort, some sense of portability through to future machines and be able to um, still use that flow. Uh, you get some error handling and recovery. You can imagine that if your workflow is cycling over a variety of parameters and generating 10,000 jobs that will be submitted to the machines, um, and in the middle a job fails because there was a problem with a queue, what happens to your whole flow, right? Does this mean the failure of the entire 10,000 flow of job, job um, 10,000 item flow of jobs, or um, can you recover? And very often, in some circumstances, uh, it'll recognize and it will retry and recover the workflow so that it will continue despite individual failures. This obviously also um, implies uh, some level of monitoring of jobs so that it can pull that off, but that monitoring is also um, useful to the user. So you want to know how things are progressing when you have a, a, a workflow that's long in time like this. Um, and provenance I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm curious how many people are familiar with the term provenance? Okay, a, a handful, maybe 10%. Um, so th that's typically the case. A lot of people are not familiar with it. and. Um, and there are different opinions about it, but the idea is that this embodies the details necessary to, to produce a result. So if I have some groundbreaking result and I publish it in a paper, and later I want to go back and reproduce it, or somebody else wants to reproduce it, say it was cold fusion. No, let's say it was not cold fusion. Um, uh, how did I produce it? How can I convey to somebody all the elements of the experiment that I ran that produced those results? Well. A lot of times, um, capturing that yourself is difficult, right? You get a code that works, and it produces results that you believe are correct, and you wonder, at, well, which version of which library was used, actually, in this case. Um, reproducing a result that you, that you generated a year ago is actually difficult, or can be difficult if you don't have these details captured somehow. Um, and the, the, the complexity is surprising, right? So we look at, you run a, a particular application, 
with uh, a particular configuration and a set of inputs, you have to hold on to all of these things, right? Um, different libraries, versions of libraries, the compiler that was used to compile the code, uh, maybe the, oper the, the version of the operating system on which this particular job ran, uh, versions of drivers that were installed at the time, um, and even the hardware that was used. Uh, to some extent, you might get a result on a system today, and in five years, the architectures will be so different that you can't reproduce that result. Right? What do we do in that case? Well, at least we would know that we can't. Um, that text really needed to be bigger. Uh, this is an example of a Swift script um, that uh, we used in the past for uh, protein folding simulations. And you can't really see it, but you can see it in the slides on your laptop if you want to. Um, the idea here, though, is that it takes a collection of um, command line arguments, including a list of uh, protein files, and uh, from them, sets up the, uh, the inputs for the job and the outputs for the job. So it's mapping these descriptions into actual physical file locations. And um, there's a, a, a two-level nested loop over number of simulations and number of proteins in the list um, to run two functions. So this looks very much like C. Um, and again, this is, this is Swift code, and Mike Wilde will talk about this in the, in the next session. Um, but you can see that it's calling two functions. One, to, uh, one is this predict CF, and the other one is to generate an image of the resulting protein. Now, as it stands, it looks like it's uh, just a small code which will just call some functions and be done. But as I said before, um, these function calls are actually submitting jobs. So depending on the number of simulations and the number of proteins in the, in the list, um, you'll get you know, n times proteins uh, jobs submitted. Um, going back to what I said before about uh, submitting 10,000 jobs and having the, the scheduler complain, uh, Swift's execution engine has a mechanism for controlling how, how for throttling your job submission. So uh, you can tell it how many jobs should be in the queue at one time. So if you've encountered that already in the queues at uh, ALCF, you will know that you'll need that sort of thing. Um, on the right, there's just a, 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 a web interface that we wrote um, to support executing these protein simulation workflows. Um, in this case, you could pick particular inputs uh, and submit the jobs, and um, you would have this list of jobs along the left side. And then for each one, you could go in and view the results. Uh, so recently, I've been working with um, uh, high energy physicists. Uh, they're um, working at the, in the Atlas collaboration at the LHC. And they, they have a, a tool chain for simulating events that take place in the Atlas detector at LHC. Um, and what this looks like is it consists of multiple stages. So we have uh, this schematic at the bottom that lists of uh, um, integration, and then a weighted event generation, and uh, an unweighting phase. And then there's a showering phase, and uh, simulation and analysis. And it looks probably very much like what, um, what a lot of you do, maybe with different names. Uh, and beneath there, you see different tool chains that are used for, uh, for executing this workflow. So I'll talk about uh, our work with AlpGen uh, is, is one of the event generation um, applications. So uh, if, you, if you're familiar with this community, they have tended to rely on um, uh, grids. They have the LHC computing grid. It consists of sites all over the planet. And um, they tend to run this kind of job as a single instance job on a single machine for 24 hours. And, um, and they need more computing, basically. Uh, so 
we wanted to look at how we could um, ramp these applications up to run on Mira and uh, run the entire workflow here. So just to clarify somewhat, um, this is an image taken from Tom LeCompte's talk. I'm working with Tom LeCompte. And uh, I'm sure he clarified this better than I did. But uh, you know what, what this is is that the particles collide in the detector. And um, event generation consists of randomly generating a lot of events, finding the ones that we care about, and then looking at the response in the, um, uh, in the detectors and uh, understanding what took place, what were the products of the collision. So, um, it said, uh, so this consists of generating this integration grid, sampling the phase space, and uh, generating weighted events based on that, and then unweighting the events. So the weighted events have some, the, the weight is a, a probability associated with it. And then there's a, a probability cutoff for the events so that when we unweight them, we throw away a bunch of them based on the weight. Uh, the, the generation of the integration grid stage is done once. Um, and then we use that same integration grid for all of the event generation jobs that come after. So the, we do the integration grid uh, once on a separate machine and then um, launch as many uh, event generation jobs as, as we can for, uh, based on that. So the changes that we had to make to, um, to get AlpGen to run uh, and, and scale reasonably were that you know, each instance wanted to read the input files in the configuration um, itself. And obviously, this doesn't scale with the file system. So we uh, distribute them over MPI and use MPI to coordinate per rank random seeds for the event generation. Um, and each rank was writing standard out and standard error, so we've changed that, obviously. Um, and uh, when, when this runs, it doesn't have a high memory requirement in terms of data, but the memory footprint was very big. And the reason was that there are uh, proton models, various proton models that are used in the application. And uh, in this version of the application, they're all bundled into the data section of the executable. Um, but it's very, very common practice in this, uh, in this community to use only one of those proton models. So the rest of them can be neglected. By neglecting them, we reduce the size of the memory footprint um, significantly, which allows us to run in 64 ranks per node and do other things too. So uh, this is a just a um, schematic view of this workflow. I'm supposed to be talking about workflows. Um, so if we start with integrating on a cluster and then do the event generation on Mira and then do the unweighting stage on, on the cluster, um, well, that's where we started. Um, right away, uh, we would want to bundle the unweighting step into the, uh, in with the event generation job. So this is now a single script job on Mira. And both of these things happen within that single job. It prevents us from having to wait in the queue and um, just really makes sense. So in this case, um, in this case, we have two different, app, two different instances of the same application being run with different configurations, which is one of the points that I made earlier. Um, uh, we also, in the other configuration, we were writing uh, one file per rank. And uh, for reasons of the application and for performance reasons, we wanted to write only one file. So we aggregate the outputs, the output events um, using MPI IO. Uh, the problem with this is that um, in between each phase, it's uh, writing the events to the file system and then reading the events from the file system. Um, and so we overcame that by using persistent memory on the compute nodes, the compute node RAM disk. Uh, again, reducing the size of the memory footprint allows us additional memory on the compute nodes, which is available 
to be used as persistent memory in this way. So that gives us a significant speed up in terms of um, this, this workflow. Now, see, I've talked about it in terms of just this application, but um, it really is a workflow in this case, right? We're running these different stages this way. Uh, if you're interested in the persistent memory on the, on the blue gene, you can see details in the, in the red book. Um, so looking at scaling, uh, this is for the event generation phase up to 1,000 nodes. Uh, you see that the modified code that uses the RAM disk, um, this is, again, um, each, each rank is generating a number of events. So this is weak scaling. And you see that with uh, using the RAM disk, we do much better than we would have done or than we did previously. And also for the unweighting phase, um, similar results. This allows us to get to this point uh, that I know Tom mentioned um, yesterday of being able to scale to all of Mira. So uh, we took AlpGen from its... Um, initial configuration of running a, as a single instance on a single node uh, and ran it in parallel on Mira. Um, this job that you see is 786 billion events of a W plus 5 jet type. I don't know, it doesn't mean much to you, but, um, well, to some of you, I'm sure it does. Uh, the, the higher jet multiplicity actually means that um, the events are more rare. So we have to generate many, many more of them to get a reasonable si uh, sample size. Um, so if we ran W plus 2 jet, for example, we would get so many events that we would overwhelm the, the, the uh, uh, communication infrastructure. Or, well, we don't tend to do that. The reason we don't tend to do it is because if you can run a single instance job on a grid node for 24 hours, um, with a low number of jets, you can get a reasonable sample size. Uh, when you go to a higher, uh, higher multiplicity or number of jets like this, um, you might get to the end of a 24-hour job and have produced zero events. Uh, and Tom likes to make the point that um, the production system at that point regards that as a failure and says, something went wrong, I didn't get any events, let me resubmit the job. So obviously that would lead to bad things. Um, so by doing this, we've been able to, uh, to generate um, events to, to basically clear the plate of uh, AlpGen event generation for Atlas uh, for the next two years. And, um, to generate exotic events of this type, which were difficult to impossible for them to do with the current uh, computing support that they have. Um, if we look at uh, this workflow, um, I've, added a, I've added a step on the right, which is some post-processing on the cluster after the Mira job. Um, that's not terribly interesting. It's not terribly compute intensive. And the point of showing you this is to say that while I've been talking about um, this workflow that consists of a few steps and maybe doesn't seem terribly interesting, the real point that you need to take from that is that what we get are requests for many, many events, more than we can do in a single job, more than we can do in many jobs. And when we get a request like that, we need some way of uh, managing the execution of all of these jobs, right? So we have many, many jobs that come through per request and multiple requests that come through. And um, so while I've been talking about workflow, we have this other level which looks like meta workflow, right? So we have to also manage things at this level. And beyond that, uh, we're doing our work in terms of workflow to get these jobs running on Mira and produce the results that Atlas wants. Um, but when we're finished, we basically hand off these data products to Atlas. And what do they do with them, right? They, they go back into the Atlas production system where they face yet more processing. 
And that is yet another workflow system. So um, it's not as, uh, you know, you, 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 could, you could think of a very well defined workflow where you knew exactly what you were going to do or the hundred different variations you're going to do and it was just a matter of running them. Um, in some cases you have an approach like that. Uh, in other cases uh, you have to adapt along the way and it requires user input to decide what the next stages are. So some of the things that they would do in the production system after we hand off these events are of each of these types. Um, so I want to also mention a uh, hack that I've been working with lately from a couple of different um, uh, simpler perspectives from, from where I stand. Uh, hack is a cosmology simulation code. I, I know that Salman talked about it yesterday uh, in, in great detail, and so I'll refer you to his talk for, for that detail. Um, two things I've been working on with, uh, with this group are uh, a thing called PDAX, which is based on Galaxy, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it's for taking portions of the analysis uh, codes and modularizing them and then being able to construct workflows from them that then are executed on different resources. And uh, also Cosmo Tools, which is for um, in situ analysis with the simulation. So, uh, Again, this is, this is Hack, and I refer you to Salman's talk for this. Um, in PDAX, the, uh, the idea is that um, this, the, the data produced by the simulations is so enormous that uh, it's not generally accessible by, by other people. You can't say, oh, I'd love to analyze the Hack data. Let me just download 200 terabytes and, and go at it. Um, but if we could provide an interface for people to be able to actually access the data uh, and run analyses on it, that would be great. Um, the, the history of, of cosmology includes um, landmark sets of uh, uh, galaxy catalogs that people have done the groundbreaking research on. And um, the simulations that are being produced, being run here, are producing catalogs like this. And those catalogs would be very useful to people to be able to um, analyze and produce results. So in this case, uh, there's a set of analysis tools that can read this data. And uh, if we can make those available to users to run their own analyses, then um, they, they, they could proceed with that without having to, it's an ideal interface for them to the data. Uh, but the idea here is that um, uh, there's simulation data that's chosen and then that data can be piped into various different analyses and you see um, that the output from uh, even those analyses can be piped into other analyses. And so given a collection of tools, users can decide how to assemble them and how to configure them to produce a result that they want. Um, and in this case, uh, the, the resulting job, once you've assembled this workflow and said to run it, each of these stages runs in a different place depending on uh, its computational intensity. So um, very simple things that summarize a data set with some columnar data might run just locally on the the host that runs the web interface, but other things will be pushed off to various resources um, that you know uh, might require hundreds of um, you know hundred node cluster. So there are instances of this running at NERSC um, and at Argon, backended by Magellan, and at Oak Ridge. Uh, well, soon, soon, but backended by some uh, dedicated analysis cluster infrastructure. Um, once you've submitted one of these workflows, you, in this environment, you get, um, you get this uh, monitoring readout on the right-hand side. It just shows you the progression of your jobs through time. And then selecting one of them, you can view its, its results or download those results. Um, 
So the point that I would make here is that uh, Galaxy, this is based on Galaxy, and Galaxy it comes out of the bioinformatics community. But they've built this tool that is, uh, that is adaptable to other domains. So you can use it, you can wrap your own tools, integrate them in here, configure it to use whatever uh, resources you have available to you, and um, not, uh, not trivially, but fairly easily have an environment like this that allows you to um, wrap the components of your, your work and then assemble them into different workflows. The other thing I wanted to mention um, briefly about Hack is uh, this Cosmo Tools, which is a, a way of getting at uh, in-memory workflows. So the Hack simulation runs, and it runs um, uh, sequential time steps. But in between the time steps, uh, it has a, an integrated mechanism for um, taking the particles on each rank at that time step and handing them off to a set of analysis routines. So, uh, so the analyses can run in situ with the simulation. So why do you care about this? Um, there are a variety of reasons. So in many cases, uh, the simulation produces so much data that there's data reduction done before you write out the data to disk, and that data is just lost. The, the data that was thrown away at that step, um, uh, the only chance that you have to analyze it is there at the time step while the data is in memory. Um, and uh, also, it's efficient to do it this way. So uh, clearly, loading enormous data back from disk to do the analysis is, uh, um, would take longer. And uh, by doing it this way, you get some intermediate uh, analysis results while the simulation is running. So from my perspective, and, and I, I could refer back to the, uh, the initial um, XKCD comic, uh, why would you want to do this? Um, in my experience, probably all of us want to do this kind of thing, right? Where you chose, given, the, given the option of managing your work manually or um, using a tool that allows you to script that, uh, you probably would choose the latter. Um, but it's up to you to find the, the, the tools that will work for you. Uh, I mentioned I have used uh, Swift. I've had good experience with Swift. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll close. Are there any questions? Events you generate, are those all standard model events? Are you looking at uh, supersymmetric models? Um, what's the most complex event you're typically generating? These are standard model events. Um, we've tended to focus on W plus 5 and Z plus 5. But um, with Alpgen, we can go up to six jets. Uh, and uh, Particle tracks, is that at the end when that, that advertises? Uh, We're talking about a hundred different type of particle tracks you're trying to simulate, or a thousand. Just to kind of get an order of magnitude idea. I, I uh, don't have the answer, but I could get back to you. Um, I can say that in the in the <clears throat> I mentioned two tool, cha tool chains for the event generation, um, and we concentrated on AlpGen here. Uh, AlpGen is a leading order method. Um, the second tool chain uses Sherpa, and we're looking at scaling Sherpa now, and it's uh, next to leading order. So it'll give us more exact results. And this community is uh, transitioning to Sherpa over time for that reason. Yes? So you have the list of tools there. Aren't all those tools available um, as Argon? Um, I think you would find good support for Swift because uh, Mike Wild has worked to ensure that that's there. Uh, in terms of the other tools, I think that list is is probably uh, 
you know, it represents options that are available. Not all of them are, are probably applicable to environments that we work in. Um, there are some of the other ones that I think uh, people are, are trying to make work in the environments where we work. I mean, you know, some of them were schedulers, right? So you have Cobalt, for example, and we've talked about workflow-like things within Cobalt. Um, there's Condor, and I know we've talked with uh, Condor people about, uh, actually, you know what, I, I, should, I should defer to the next talk for that question. The Swift guys will, will have a better answer on that than I will. There was another question in the back. Yeah, I was just going to ask about Galaxy. Um, so did you install sort of your own workings with Galaxy, and how did that sort of interface with resources at Argon, Oak Ridge? Was that easy to set up? Can you comment on that at all? Uh, I find Galaxy, um, yeah, I think Galaxy is, uh, it's, you know, I, I, I worked on this sort of thing for some time. And uh, when I got to Galaxy, I felt like they had, they had done it right. For a long time, I had frustrations about the way that things would work. And I think these guys got it right. They really they, they built the code in a way that uh, has abstractions in the right place, that makes it easy to integrate your own applications. Um, it's easy to configure it to run on different, uh, different machines. Um, you know, modulo a couple of, a couple of sore spots. Um, there's good documentation and there's a good community. So I think there's good support for trying to move forward. It's, uh, you know, the, when I've had questions and asked the developers, I've gotten a quick response. So it's all, uh, I, I think those things are all important to deciding to choose something like this. Yeah.